You know, maybe the most important uh, thinker in the 20th century regarding philosophy of science, not, maybe not the most important, but most influential thinker is, is Karl Popper, at least on certain fields. So maybe tell us a little bit about who Karl Popper was, and uh, we can talk about some of his influence. Yeah, Karl Popper was an Austrian um, philosopher of science. He was associated with, um, but not part of, the Vienna Circle, which is the um, kind of philosophical circle in the 20s and 30s in, in Vienna that gave birth to um, uh, logical positivism, logical empiricism, if you've heard those terms uh, Tell before. Tell in a sentence what logical Yeah, so, so it's a, uh, a form of uh, experience-first philosophy that couples um, uh, a, a, um, a, a, a sense data view of perception, so this idea that sense perception is given to us as atomic units. Um, blue here now is what you get from perception. Kind of couples that way of thinking with the new logic that was being developed in the early 20th century. Um, so this kind of crowd has a has a circle in Vienna that Popper visited occasionally. And um, Wittgenstein is another important 20th century philosopher who was going to these, uh, these meetings in Vienna. Um, Anyway, Popper wasn't a logical positivist. He was, or he saw himself as being one of their like harsh critics at offering an alternative. Um, he winds up at the London School of Economics uh, eventually. Mm -hmm. um, he was friends with Hayek, Friedrich Hayek, uh, the Austrian economist. Um, and eventually he's in the United States uh, as well. Um, but you know, one of the reasons I'm teaching a class on Karl Popper currently for ARU is not just his influence as a philosopher of science, but he has a whole um, system of thought uh, where he's interested in uh, offering a theory of rationality is the way I, I think about it. And um, that has a pretty wide ranging influence on people, not just in the sciences, but in thinking about politics. Um, his book, The Open Society and Its Enemies is a defense of a free society. Um, very interesting read. He's one of the few thinkers in the 20th century, other than Ayn Rand, to put the issue, the major issues of the 20th century in terms of individualism versus collectivism. And he's squarely on the individualist side. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but that book is you know, influential on libertarian types, some kind of moderate right types, but also at the same time on um, some progressive, uh, progressive figures. So that George Soros's Open Society is named after uh, after that book, um, so how, how does how does that make it? How do you, how do you make sense of that fact? Well, the the kind of older non Marxist uh, leftists see themselves as liberals, mm -hmm. as being in favor of democratic open societies, you know, democratic socialism, so called. Um, they don't see themselves as being uh, authoritarian or in favor of one party rule, or so. Um, and they often they see themselves as being opponents to that you know they're anti-fascist, right? So, um, and uh, I, I guess that's where the common uh, common cause is post you know post uh, post war liberalism. So, you know, who are some of the or what are the areas in which he has had the most profound impact or the most the most influence? I mean, I know from economics. Um, maybe the most important essay that Milton Friedman wrote, or, or the one that he wrote about methodology, is purely Popperian. And, uh, you know, that, that was that is considered one of the peaks of Milton Friedman's career. Yeah, well, we should get we should get into uh, eventually some of the details of what is and isn't Popperian. So my recollection of that essay is that it's in certain respects, Popper would, okay. uh, would, would if, if I recall, it's Friedman saying that what matters is um, whether or not your uh, your postulates are uh, come out uh, passing tests. Um, you can you can uh, whether, have, whether your theory has predictive power or not. Yeah, has predictive power. Yeah, so that that much. Um, but Popper is a realist. He thinks scientific theories are approximations to the truth. So he thinks there's more to that. Uh, okay. more to science than just that, you know, it makes the right predictions or make, you know, some people have a view that science is like not true or false. It's like a tool. Um, and that's not Popper. Popper thinks scientific theories are, uh, are false and approximating to the truth. 
So who are some of the other people that that he would have uh, have influenced and and you know how influential is he today within the realm of 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 science? Yeah. So in in philosophy of science, he's not influential, or he's not anymore. Um, like if you're talking about academic philosophy yeah. people in the universities, um, his heyday I think would be the maybe the 30s through the 60s in philosophy of science. So he's there's a, a line of influence from um, Popper to um, two people that are a little more obscure, Feyerabend and uh, Lakatosh are two mid 20th century philosophers of science. Actually, Feyerabend um, might be a familiar name to some people in the audience because Rand criticizes him by name in the essay. I think it's from the horse's mouth in uh, in the book Philosophy Who Needs It. And mm -hmm. there's amusing correspondence between Fire Robin and some other people where he praises Rand for having the best invective. Uh, so there's <laughs> a little popper, you know, twice removed popper tie-in. So he's influential on them. The figure that most of uh, would you your audience would be most likely to have heard of is Thomas Kuhn, who's a mm, writing in the 60s, I think. So there's a kind of line of influence through these figures to a sort of skepticism about science which Popper himself did not appreciate. He thinks of himself again as a realist. Scientific theories are, you know, you can judge one is better than the other. One is more true than the other, uh, than another. Um, now you can never really get to a perfectly true theory. You can always get, only get closer to the truth. So there's that line of influence. Um, but I think his biggest line of influence is outside of academic philosophy um, and on scientists themselves. Mm -hmm. So, if you, as so I've seen this both in practice from practicing scientists and from uh, sort of pop science communicators like Bill Nye, the science guy, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, those types. Uh, also, I've seen it come up in um, literary depictions of science. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the if you ask a practicing scientist who's you know not like actively interested in philosophy of science, they'll probably give you some picture of what they're doing is like, well, um, we have sort of background beliefs about uh, the, you know, reproduction of bacteria or something. And we have some new hypotheses and what we're concerned with isn't so much where we get these new hypotheses. What we want to do is put them to the, a rigorous test. And if they pass a rigor, if our hy new hypothesis pass a rigorous te test, we kind of, we're not certain that it's true. We're not under any delusions that we have some kind of in deep insight into the nature of reality, but we do know that it's not been refuted yet. And we keep going through this process of um, subjecting our, our hypotheses, our scientific uh, speculations to testing. And, you know, through time we get um, kind of the image sort of, sort of resolves, but never gets to perfect, um, perfect revolution, a uh, resolution. And you also kind of see this idea come up in uh, defenses of science. Like if you think of uh, maybe what was this 15 years ago was the last time we had a big wave of creationism and controversy mm -hmm. in the schools. So, well, um, uh, creation theory isn't falsifiable. That is, you could not do a test that would refute it. And that's based, that's a kind of simplistic Popperian idea that, what science, what distinguishes science is that you can if, subject your theories to a test that would refute them. Um, so that's, that's a lot of the influence it's had, like how people think about science. And now I said, that's a kind of naive or sim a simplistic version of Popper, but it's accurate, even simplified uh, to Popper. Um, so another, another uh, way in which Popper's had a lot of influences to people's thinking about uh, being rational or uh, objective. I think there's a, I see a big Popperian influence in the so-called um, rationalist community. Uh, Slate Star Codex, uh, the, the blog, um, I think he renamed it Astral Codex 10. The author is Scott Alexander. Yep. Uh, it's a popular blog. Uh, the, there's a group blog that Scott Alexander helped found, which is called Less Wrong. Um, that's very, or was in its heyday, widely read in the kind of tech sphere. And just the title of that blog, Less Wrong, is very mm -hmm. Popperian. So you subject your beliefs to uh, to tests and you get less wrong with time. Not that you get 
to not right. that you get to the truth, that you get right, but you get less wrong. Uh, and then, like I mentioned earlier, there's the kind of political um, political influence, which is that one for me is harder to track uh, the like how uh, who and how much um, the influence is. But yeah, I mean, I find it very influential. Again, I don't know if accurately influential because I don't know Papa well enough. But but the libertarians talk about him all the time, primarily through Hayek, I think. Yeah, probably. The influence of Hayek, they both were at LSC, I think, at about the same time. and They were, and, they were friends, and they dedicated they books yeah. to each other, so yeah. And then, uh, and, and I think that, so there's a lot of people in the Hayek tradition among libertarians um, hawking back to, uh, uh, to Papa. Um, yeah, so... Uh, so what what is your estimation about how interesting or original or important he is as a philosopher in the context of kind of the history of the philosophy of science or the history of philosophy, uh, or, you know, certainly over the last, uh, you know, a couple of hundred years? I find him a really interesting uh, figure if you move beyond what you'd get in like an intro to philosophy of science class. So I used to know Popper as this sort of falsificationist um, thing that I, everybody learns in, you know, un undergraduate, if you take a philosophy of science class, but uh, a couple of years ago, I started to look at him, you know, more just what other things that he written on. And I was surprised at the breadth of um, uh, subjects. He had something interesting to say on. So just, we're not so here's I mentioned I'm teaching a class so uh, on him so let me give you uh, two things so one is um, he has a view that there is a common thread amongst rationalist and empiricist philosophers of the Enlightenment and he talks about them as having secularized important religious errors error e r r o r uh, errors uh, which. <laughs> Sounds a lot like the kind of thing Ayn Rand would say. Um, yeah. And now I, we can talk more about what exactly that uh, that view of his is, um, but just that he's kind of thinking broadly about the influence ideas have on history, and on, I mean he traced like this is how he traces back the rise of to, uh, of authoritarianism in the West. It's these errors, the Bacon, Descartes, the early Enlightenment figures were really great and revolutionary in that they wanted to pull down the authority of the church and give, um, you know, give autonomy to individuals to decide themselves. But he thinks they replaced the kind of authority of God or the ancients with two other false idols, the authority of your senses or the authority of your reason. Hmm. And he thinks that relying on your senses or your reason as an infallible source of knowledge is just the same mistake as relying on religious revelation. So I think that's a really interesting kind of um, thing. The, uh, the other I had in mind that I'm not covering in my popper class is nonetheless very interesting is his defense of free will. He has an argument that uh, determinism is self-contradictory which is very mm -hmm. few people like Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brandon make that argument in the old objectivist newsletter. Yeah. And um, it, there's not a lot of people in the history of philosophy who've done that. There's a well, Popper, there's Kant. Um, and I think the next figure that I know of is Epicurus, maybe I might mm -hmm. be mis mistaken. It's one of the ancient philosophers. I might be misremembering which one. Um, so, uh, so that's, um, that's an, another uh, kind of point of contrast with Rand, but he's he's interesting to me because he he I think of him as a systematic thinker, who's um, not as original or powerful, nowhere near as original or powerful as uh, you know a Plato or a, a Rand or an Aristotle, but and not as powerful like as a Descartes, but original and systematic enough that he really stands out in the 20th century where you don't really get those kind of people at all. Mm -hmm. um, and especially that he's working in, you know, academic analytic departments where they're like against that kind of way of doing philosophy and Popper, somebody think, no ideas matter and they change the way the world evolves and like they have life and death consequences. And when you get into his political thinking, it's 
all of the stuff from his epistemology is there. Like, here's how wrong views of essences made people adopt Marxist views of history and oh, wow. how, that, how that led to this and that, you know. Um, so uh, there's a lot to, um, you know, espe especially if you like ideas, just generally you're interested in ideas and the impact they have on history, just to see somebody else coming from it you know, as an objective, as somebody coming from like a completely different perspective, um, raising some of the same questions and a rough contemporary uh, of Rand Popper died in the nineties, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, does he have a, a, a moral theory and ethics? Uh, so I, I should say I'm not a Popper expert, certainly not a Popper scholar. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't, I have a couple books on Popper, like secondary books, what's Popper about, and none of them really talk about any moral theories that he, that he had. I would imagine he's, uh, a moral skeptic, but I, I'm, I just don't, yeah. I just don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's certainly moral elements to his defense of individualism, and he thinks it's superior to collectivism. So um, there's the kind of social, uh, you know, if you want to think of it, um, social morals are, are, are there um, in that he's a proponent of individualism. But if you think, like, does he have a view of virtue or, uh, you know, does he think there's objective moral values? Or, um, I could see a case for either way, but I mean, none of the anthologies I have uh, or that, you know, I have a, this is kind of my favorite Popper book, Conjectures and Refutations. There's really not much of anything about morals. Okay. So uh, at, the, at, the, at the heart of, of, it seems like the heart of Popper is epistemology. I mean, he sees epistemology in, in politics. Um, so, so how does he approach the field? I mean, it, you said he's, he rejects God and authority that is external to you, but he also rejects the authority in a sense of reason and the senses. So, so what, what's left, right? What, so what is there? Yeah, so he endorses a view that's sometimes called fallibilism, which is that there is no infallible source of information or knowledge about the world. Mm -hmm. So objectivism would be, a, if you, you know, I think you could raise a question of whether or not this is the right way to make your categories. But if you were to momentarily accept the categories of fallibilism versus infallibilism, Rand would be a, a, an infallible. So the senses are an infallible source of information. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 now, she has a very different view of what that means than um, the empiricists who also, in a certain respect, thinks your senses are, you know, if you hear red now is a kind of sense information you might get, which is that there is a red patch in front of you at this moment is not something you could be wrong about. Um, so in that sense, that's infallible. Um, infallibilist, uh, rationalists tend to, are, are, are infallible. So the, if it a priori, um, I think therefore I am, or I exist as a thinking thing from Descartes, like you can't be wrong about that. So long as you understand what that means, you can't be wrong about it. And Popper thinks, no, a, a, every, um, every, you know, proposition you could entertain in your mind could be, uh, could be mistaken. So that's and one. Basically, there is a truth. There is reality. Yeah, th this is this is a question. If you if you that I think, it, how can Popper maintain that given the other things he believes? But that is one of his convictions that there is a um, that we do have knowledge um, that scientific theories are they're not exactly true. They're closer to the truth. So he has a technical concept he calls verisimilitude, which if you like break down the roots of vera being coming from truth. And then the similitude is like, like, so it means like truth, like, or truth likeness. Um, and he has, you know, if you really get into the popper weeds, there's like technical definitions of this, where he tries to quantify how truth, like one theory is versus another by comparing the number of falsified propositions in one or the other. So you could like really get into this, but I, I think the, the two, the two points that are most, important for Popper are the fallibilism. And then um, is it there, if there's a name for this one, he doesn't think that uh, knowledge has justification in its favor or proof so or confirmation. So um, he thinks that that idea that you when you entertain a proposition, you have to establish that it's true with the evidence. He thinks that is one of these religious errors. 
um, really what you do when you're entertaining a hypothesis is sub, um, evidence is relevant in that you subject it to criticism. That is, you have a, um, you know, uh, your, your own and I will talk for two hours is my hypothesis, what would falsify that? Well, we just see what time the call ends and then that's okay. If it's two hours, then the hypothesis passed the test. If not, then it fails. There's no, there's only like trying to falsify or trying to refute. That's what epistemology is about. It's not about um, going from the ground up and, and proving something. Um, so those are the two kind of pillars of, uh, of, of Popper's thinking. There's no inductive proof. There's no confirmation. There's no um, support for what you believe. There's only criticism um, and that every source of knowledge or belief is fallible.